is that when I was like 20 years old and had a little bit of disposable income for the first time, I had no idea what mm. to do with it. I realize this conversation might seem a little tone deaf these days. Just, uh, I'm not sure. I know a lot of people are going through a hard time economically, but still, if you're making money for the first time and you have some money sitting in a checking account and you don't know what to do with it, yeah, it, I think it helps to have some resources to kind of, or hear someone having a conversation just about that. A lot of people who uh, listen or watch this podcast are in their 20s, mm -hmm. so they're maybe making money for the first time. Uh, and when I was that age, I remember walking into a bank and some guy convinced me to buy a bunch of mutual funds of that bank, which means uh, it was basically a product of that bank. And it was very much in their interest <laughs> to sell me that product. Oh, yeah. I was paying like high management fees for them to invest my money for me. Yeah. And it was only years later that I sort of came to the realization that I didn't have to rely on those sorts of instruments or those sorts of products, right? So maybe we could just have a little bit of a conversation about if you have money for the first time, don't know what to do with it, uh, and you're interested in investing in the stock market, how can you just sort of do that yourself? Or if that even is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Do you have a similar experience? Like, do you remember for the first time sort of realizing you could invest your money yourself? Or? Yeah, I, uh, the, the first time, maybe when I was an undergrad and I was working, I, I was working since high school, so I had a little yeah. bit of disposable income. And I just put it all in a savings account. In Canada, we have these things called TFSAs, yeah. which are some tax-sheltered accounts, so you don't have to pay tax on the, the interest you get on mm -hmm. your, your... At the time, I just had cash savings. Okay. Uh, and in, in the States, these are called Roth IRAs. It's essentially the same structure gotcha. uh, as opposed to RSPs, which are like the American 401ks. Yeah, more it's, for your retirement. It's just yeah. in terms of like when you're paying tax on it. But I guess just to really dumb it down for people, if, if you take anything away from this, from my perspective, is like uh, I remember finding resources eventually. I know there was a blog called like Canadian Couch Potato Investing yep. or something like that. They're great. Yeah, I think they still exist even, but... It basically just uh, taught you that, you know, there are ETFs, mm -hmm. exchange traded funds that typically have very little fees you're paying yeah. to the institutions that manage them. And if you just have a very simple way of sort of balancing how much, you, like maybe you have one that represents the Canadian mm -hmm. uh, industries, one that represents uh, US, sure. maybe one's North America, maybe you'd want some global exposure. But they'll even sort of guide you and you want like maybe put 30% of your money into this one. Maybe only put 10% of your money in emerging markets. And with very little effort, you can sort of manage this yourself through having some sort of, you know, you obviously you need to set up an account somewhere where you can invest directly, which yeah. the major banks typically let you do. But that's why you have all these third-party apps like Robinhood and stuff like that as well, yeah. right? Well, we could spend a million hours talking about this kind of stuff, and I don't really want to have to explain what emerging markets are. You know, this is that that's that's an advanced topic. Right? Sure. I, if anything, I just want people to yeah. take away from this that, like, uh, yeah, it, don't don't go to your bank, don't go to your brick and mortar <laughs> big five buy. bank, don't go to like like you know Citibank in in the states or. Uh, or TD or CIBC and tell them like, I have $50,000 or even like $2,000 that I yeah. want to invest because they're salespeople. At the, the people you talk to at the banks are salespeople and they, they're, they're there to make money for the bank. And mm -hmm. they, they probably have uh, some sort of bonus structure where if they sell enough of their high fee mutual funds, they get like, you know, I don't know, like some Tim Hortons gift they certificates have or something, right? They, they have incentives, yeah. This isn't an argument against having a financial advisor by no, any means, right? Yeah, like uh, Christine and I have a person that helps us manage money these days, yeah. and that guy has a fiduciary responsibility to us, yeah. meaning he doesn't have an obligation to sell his bank's products to us. He has an obligation to make decisions in the best interest of his clients to make the money, yeah, essentially. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, not everyone is a fancy person like you with a financial... <laughs> I don't have a financial <laughs> advisor. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I'm not saying it's something that's open to a lot of people necessarily yeah. either. I'm actually not sure about that. What sort of threshold is there to having... There, there's... So the, if the kind of the couch potato type advice these days yeah. is to find a fee-only financial advisor, someone who will charge you like a few hundred dollars mm -hmm. to give you some advice... And he's not making money based on the kind of investments that he's going to tell you to invest in. He's not getting any kickbacks from, from the kind of stuff that he's investing your money in. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, he'll just going to charge you a flat rate. So mm -hmm. you can trust his advice because he, he doesn't have the, these sort of perverse incentives. You know, he's, he's not incentivized to go 
give you high fee mutual funds. Gotcha. He'll actually give you actual honest advice. But now, like uh, one of the great things the internet has done is sort of democratize basically everything for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And now that there are these sort of couch potato, this, this phrase we keep using, approach mm -hmm. to sort of investing, where uh, you, you can do it yourself. Or there are services which are called robo-advisors, uh, which are meant to be sort of like a compromise between mutual funds and going and buying your own units of index ETFs, if uh, yeah. if that means so anything to anybody. Replacing your financial advisor with a robot is that the yeah. future? Basically? I think we've given no useful <laughs> advice here. So we, we are not financial advisors. No. But uh, once you have uh, saved up enough money beyond like a few months of your expenses, everybody should have a small emergency fund. Yeah, I agree. And, and after that, if you're saving up for a car. Or, uh, or a house, or I don't know, like uh, even like a PS5 or something, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, just keep your money in a savings account and try, try to make as much interest as you can. Again, the, the physical banks are going to give you bad interest rates. Mm -hmm. Probably need to go to some sort of online-only bank. And after you've taken care of that kind of stuff, where you have some money you want to invest for either retirement or like a house purchase down the road, then you could think about investing your money in stocks or bonds, kind of the, the, the kind of standard investment vehicles mm -hmm. that are available to people. And then you can think about things like robo-advisors or low-fee ETFs. But you, you'll want to do some homework there and be very careful about who you trust for advice because a lot of people are, are in it for their cut. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And that, yeah. in a nutshell, is the advice I guess I'd want people to leave with here. Mm -hmm.